You can start, sir. Okay, I'll start. Yeah, I'll start, sir. Okay. So, very good morning to all of you. Uh, so, in this couple of set of lectures, uh, as part of the refresher course at summer school, so we look at uh, jets from supermassive black holes. And before I get into the details of it, uh, I'll just give you a brief outline of uh, what astrophysical jets are, a brief historical outline, and then we will look at some of the physical processes which may be operating. And we'll also look at how uh, the observational signatures are for the launching of these jets. How do people sort of, uh, how, do, how astronomers arrived at this scenario? Uh, while in these couple of lectures, we will deal with astrophysical jets from supermassive black holes, uh, as the organizers have put it. But I should also stress that uh, the phenomenon of astrophysical jets is not confined to merely those from supermassive black holes, which reside at the nuclei of galaxies, but also in various other situations. For example, when star formation takes place before stars come to the main sequence, protostars, the Titauri stars, you do get jet-like jet, uh, jet -like emission. And then you also get jet-like jet, -like, jet, em, jet -em emission from gamma ray bursts. You see them in X-ray binaries. And these and the phenomena of jets are very, very nicely seen in what are called microquasars, which are galactic objects, and perhaps present in other galaxies as well. But before, um, uh, so with, one has to bear it in mind that the focus in this couple of lectures would be only on those which are from the centers of massive galaxies. But the physics and the phenomena of astrophysical jets is more widespread than what I'm going to cover in these two lectures. To give you a brief historical outline, how did this come about? How do we know that jets exist? And where did it all start off? So I would refer to some of the seminal papers on this. Historically, actually, it was Walter Bard and Minkowski in 1954 who looked at uh, the, the, the nearby galaxy uh, M87, which is in the Virgo cluster of galaxies. And they noted uh, in their paper of several strong condensations are in the outer parts of the jet, which extends about 20 arc seconds from the nucleus and has an average width of about two arc seconds. Superposed on the nucleus appears a strong emission line of O2, uh, lambda 3727, which is shifted relative to the G-type spectrum uh, by minus 295 plus or minus 100 kilometers per second. So this was one of the first early, uh, the early recognitions of linear collimated features, which are uh, seen in the centers of galaxies. And at that time, they did not really know what uh, this feature was, and neither did, neither was it known about what was responsible for the emission that was seen, the constituents of it, but they just did note the existence of this linear feature. A similar feature was also seen in the first quasar which was identified. The galaxy which I talked about a little while earlier in the previous slide, uh, was also catalogued as a strong radio source. And it was also catalogued by Messier, who catalogued diffuse objects in the sky, not to confuse with his search for comets. And therefore it is also known as M87, the 87 source in Messier's catalog. And it is also catalogued in the 3CR catalog. It's a strong radio source, 3C274. As, and this is uh, the second instance which I want to give you was uh, many years later, this was in the early 60s, when from when radio surveys of the sky were available, and people were trying to astronomers were trying to find optical counterparts of these radio sources, because without knowing the optical counterparts, there was not nothing much you could learn about the sources themselves, except there were sources of radio emission in the sky, and in the course of trying to find optical counterparts of radio sources you needed to have accurate positional measurements. For the nearby galaxies, for example, where the image of the galaxy is also large, because it is close by, and the radio images in those days also had poor resolution. Uh, you would have learned from your Neurogist lecture as well that the resolution is given by lambda by D, 
uh, a factor in front, 1.2 lambda by t, d. And because the radio wavelengths are long, the resolution would have been poor. And so unless you had accurate positions, uh, it, there could be many op optical objects within the beam of your telescope or the resolution of your telescope. For nearby objects, because the angular sizes of the galaxies were large also, you could, you could be reasonably certain, hold your heart in your hands and say, hey, th these two are coincident and, uh, and a radio source is associated with, it, with this galaxy. But when it comes to objects, objects which are more distant, then that fails because within that beam, there could be many optical objects, many galaxies or star-like objects. And so you need much better optical accuracy uh, in the positions of these optical objects. But in those days, interferometry had not yet developed and the resolutions were rel relatively poor. And so what uh, Cyril Hazard and his collaborators did was they used the occultation of a radio source by the moon because the moon's position is accurately known and, and, and the moon's edge acts as a diffraction pattern. So if it's a point source, you'll get a point source diffraction pattern. If it's an extended source, the pattern will get smeared out. But by knowing the position of the moon, you know exactly where the source is. And by looking at the diffraction pattern, you can also infer the structure of the source as the source goes behind the, behind the moon, as well as when it emerges from the other side. So this was a technique which was used extensively using the UT radio telescope to measure the angular sizes of radio sources and see how it varies with flux density and establish that source properties evolve with cosmic epoch lending another strong piece of evidence in favor of the cosmological model of the universe. Now, this particular object, 3CR273, was occulted by the moon, and, and you got to make the maximal use of it because you can't tell the moon where to go and which source to occult. You'll have to wait that nature does it. And they, when they measured the accurate position, uh, they realized that it was associated with a star-like object. And this was new because most of the other objects were associated with galaxies. Uh, relatively nearby galaxies. And then when they measured the, measured the spectrum of this object, unlike stellar spectra, which you have heard about earlier in the series, that it did not have absorption lines, but it had very strong emission lines. And Schmidt noted, Martin Schmidt, a star of about 13 magnitude and a faint wisp or jet. It is not visible within 11 arc seconds from the star and ends abruptly at 20 arc second from the star. The close correlation between the radio star and the radio structure in the star with the jet is suggestive and intriguing. So you can see the word jet was used by Bard and Minkowski while describing this feature in the, in the uh, galaxy in the jet in M87. And it has also been used by the uh, by uh, Martin Schmidt while trying to uh, describe this wisp or jet-like feature in, um, in, in a quasar 3C273. But actually the, 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 the linear feature in, in M87 was recognized by Herbert Curtis in 1918 as, as early as that. So for a long time, the field was dormant. Herbert Curtis noted a curious straight ray lies in a gap in a nebulosity apparently connected with a nucleus by a thin line of matter, the rays brighted at its inner end, which is 11 arc seconds from the nucleus. So you can see that, you know, it was accidentally discovered, but, or, or discovered, but the nature was completely unknown. The word jet was first used by Bard and Minkowski, uh, suggesting outflow because they saw a spectrum which was blue shifted relative to the systemic velocity of the galaxy. So all galaxies, as you know, are moving away from us due to the Hubble expansion of the universe, uh, Hubble emitter now expansion of the universe. But, uh, but relative to the systemic velocity, if the, if the gas is coming towards you, then, then you, know that, you know that material is being ejected from it. Uh, so this is because of the blue shift, they could infer that. And so he used the term jet without really knowing much about the detailed physical processes. So this is the kind of brief historical outline of recognition of a jet and the use of the terminology of the jet. 
Uh, in the case of M87, there was some evidence of movement. But in the case of the quasar, at that point, there was no evidence of movement because as we shall see, uh, this is really continuum emission and there are no emission lines from the jet itself to try and infer its motion. Now, if I were to fast forward many, many years, um, uh, then this is an image of the first galaxy that, that I talked about, M87. And this is a radio image of it made with a very large array. And this is the nucleus of the galaxy, a compact core associated with it. And then there is a linear jet-like feature. And note in that in this source, the jet is on only one side of the nucleus. Uh, so this is a one-sided radio jet. And this is the same object, same jet, just a little box blown up over here, observed with the Hubble Space Telescope, the wide field camera. And what you notice over here more clearly, uh, which is also visible, but not as clearly over here in the radio image, is a prominent sort of feature over here. And this is what Herbert Curtis, you know, Barton Minkowski noted. And, uh, and this is believed now to be a shock created by flow in the jet, uh, flow by, by, by flow in the jet. And this is where magnetic fields are complex. There is increased emissivity from it. Now, you can go to higher and higher resolutions. This is a factor of two. You can see this is 2,000 light years across. And if you probe right into the nucleus, what you see is the core of the nucleus and then jets, which open up at a large opening angle, but then it, is, it gets collimated into this narrow jet-like feature uh, traveling many kiloparsecs. And most of you may have seen this iconic picture when you go even further in. Okay, this is amongst the highest resolutions that have been achieved of the order of 20 micro arc seconds or so. And uh, so this is uh, the image taken with the Event Horizon Telescope, which splashed it, uh, newspapers across the world a couple of years ago. And here you can see the shadow of the black hole itself and, ga and gas around it. Uh, the asymmetry is believed to be due to uh, motion of the fluid. And, and in this region, so close to the black hole, strong gravity operates. A light is very bent, so you could actually see the back of the mission as well. And there have been very interesting simulations to, to sort of reproduce these structures um, in, in, in the nuclei of galaxies hosting supermassive black holes. So black holes have been estimated to be about, mass has been estimated to be about six and a half billion solar masses. And I've also written down the Schwarzschild radius over here and the diameter of the ring. So you can see this scale is about 0 0.1 light years. And this has gone much, much smaller. It is 0 0.01 light years. Okay. And this is, this is a picture of M87, uh, today's, today our understanding of it. And we will try to understand some of these features in the course of these two lectures. Now, if I were to show you a current day image of the quasar 3C273, uh, and I wanted to particularly stress this because not only have I mentioned about the jets being visible in the radio and optical, but jets have been ubiquitous or they have been very commonly seen with the, particularly with the advent of the Chandra X-ray telescope at X-ray wavelengths as well. Uh, this is a radio image. Uh, this is an optical image of it. And this is an X-ray image of it. Okay. Now you can see that although the jet is of somewhat similar length, uh, they are on the same uh, position angle, but there are, there are subtle and important differences in the regions of where the knots or peaks of emission are. You can see that at the radio, it is right at the outer edge of it. In the, in the optical region, the various condensations and knots of emission along the flow of the jet. And then in the X-rays, what you see is that the peak of emission is closer to the, uh, closer to the core. The core is uh, beyond this picture over here, and uh, it is not shown in this image. What is shown in this image are are the uh, is just are the, just the jets it's just a jet at different wavelengths at radio wavelengths optical wavelengths and x-ray wavelengths so we will try and look understand a little bit about the different physical processes which may be responsible uh, for the emission at the jets which we see uh, 
but before going on to that, let me show you uh, some, of the, some of the other pictures as well and highlight to you the different kinds of jets, even at radio wavelengths, that one has been able to identify. So as I mentioned that in the early days, that uh, the, the sources which could be identified were relatively close by, namely objects like Virgo A, Centaurus A, Cygnus A is slightly more distant, and Fornix A, Hercules A. And, and as I mentioned a little while earlier, that high angular resolutions are required to identify the more distant sources. And as interferometry improved, this better resolution was not only really important for identifying um, smaller and fainter and more distant sources reliably, but it also was extremely important to understand the structures of these radio sources. Uh, yesterday, Neeraj talked to you about uh, uh, interferometry and how to make images at radio wavelengths. And what I'm showing you right now is, a, is, a, is an image of Cygnus A, one of the most powerful radio sources in the sky. Uh, radio, and it consists of the nucleus over here. The optical object is shown below. And as you can see, the optical object is a bit of a mess. Initially, they thought that it may be two galaxies in collision. But we know that this galaxy has a lot of dust and dust obscures and gives very com can give very complex patterns. And so basically, uh, the radio nucleus sits in the center of the optical galaxy over here. And you can see the jet squirting out over here. It's a faint jet. And there's also actually a faint counter jet, which is not quite clearly visible in this particular image. And you can see that this jet um, goes and deposits its energy in this outer sort of peaks of emission, which are called hotspots. And basically what is happening is that energy is channeled along this, uh, along the jet, a relativistic plasma. And in these jets, they're moving at supersonic velocities, Mach number is much greater than one. The velocity is a fair fraction of the velocity of light. And uh, a fair fraction of velocity of light. And, um, and, and it forms a bow shock over here. There would, could be a reverse shock. There's a marked disk which forms over here. And energy is deposited at the outer edges. Okay, At the outer edges where the hotspots are formed. So you can see in these jets, the amount of flux density in the jet itself is very small and, and most of the energy is deposited at the outer edges and then the plasma flows backwards forming these extended lobes of emission, okay? And so, but not all jets look similar to this, okay? Um, I will just show you examples of that. Uh, this is another example where um, you don't see uh, this is an example of a source where, unlike in the case of Cygnus A, you don't see prominent hotspots at the outer edges. The jets are symmetric, more symmetric. Uh, you can see the jets more clearly over here. And also they seem to be, in the image as you can see, bubbles of plasma coming out. So the, this radio source is characterized by diffuse plumes of emission on the opposite sides. So energy is deposited uh, much before it reaches the outer edges. And there's no well-defined hotspots at the outer edges, as I just mentioned. And, and, and also because you can see various plumes of emission, one also sort of hints at towards the uh, jet activity being episodic or recurrent. That means is are there plasmas or relativistic plasma, which is being ejected periodically rather than being continuous or quasi-continuous from the nucleus of the active galaxy. Okay, now I can see a hand being up, but what I plan to do is that I plan to stop in between so that you can ask your questions on whatever I have covered. So uh, just be a little patient, you'll, you'll get your chance very soon. Okay, so, so the, this is two classes of structures which I've highlighted towards to you. One is where there are um, hotspots at the outer edges and ones where there are diffuse plumes of emission. I will show you one or two more examples of that. And you can see an example over here. Uh, this is, uh, uh, there are two sources from the 3CR catalog. Uh, this is 3CR 296. 
uh, don't worry too much about the distance and the size right now. I just wanted to illustrate to you the structures of it. So the, on the greenish thing, you can see is the optical image of it. So you can see other optical objects in the vicinity as well. And, and you can see the diffuse plumes of emission without any prominent hotspots. The jets are more symmetric. They are, uh, they are contribute a larger amount of the flux density compared to the object below, which is associated with a quasar. Here, what you can see are very prominent edges at the uh, hotspots at the outer edges, and you see a jet which is one-sided or asymmetric. So it was Bernie Fanerov, who's now in South Africa leading, and he was instrumental in getting the square kilometer array, which you may have heard about to South Africa uh, when he was a student at Cambridge working with Julia Riley. They divide a classification scheme where uh, these kinds of objects were called Fanerov Riley class one, and these set of objects are called Fanerov Riley class two. These objects tend to be more luminous, the jets are better collimated. They probably drain less material from the surroundings and they're often more asymmetric. They believe to be have high mark numbers, less susceptible to instabilities. Whereas in this, in this case, in the Fanner of Friday class one sources, they probably interact more vigorously with the interstellar medium. They're low mark number jets. You can see they're not as well collimated and they drain material from the surroundings. And the radial luminosity on the whole of the FR class one objects. Fanerov Riley often gets shortened to FR. That is what you will meet when you read the literature often, that uh, these are called Fanerov Riley class one. These are called Fanerov Riley class two. So these objects are of lower luminosity on the average compared to the Fanerov Riley class two objects. So these are objects which, uh, uh, which, which we will meet later again to understand differences in the radio jets, but these are broadly the two categories of classification of the extended radio structures of these sources. I've used the term galaxies and quasars as two different kinds of objects over here, uh, but today there is a belief and there is observational evidences to support it as well, that the quasars are nothing but galaxies with abnormally luminous nuclei. So you're not being able to easily pick up the galaxy around it because the nucleus is extremely bright. And that is similar to the situation of why you don't see the stars when the sun is out because observations as well as our eyes are dynamic range limited. It's only when we were able to achieve much higher dynamic range as well as resolution. Otherwise the images will get smeared out and you will not be able to see the surrounding galaxy uh, and this was possible, some from ground-based observations, but largely the Hubble Space Telescope made a big difference. And one could try, one could, one saw that these quasars are nothing but galaxies with abnormally luminous nuclei. You will hear more about active galactic nuclei from my colleague and friend, uh, Gulab Devangan. So I will not uh, delve on AGN as such. I'll focus much more on the jets. So radio galaxies and quasars we saw have jets which um, uh, squirting out from the nucleus. Sometimes you may not see the jet itself, uh, but you know they exist because the outer lobes are, are prominent and there is an optical galaxy sitting in between. And these source, the jets, obviously they have to start off young when they start off from the inner regions of the galaxy, but they can move to very large distances. You can see over here, it is 4.7 megaparsecs. So one parsec is about 3.26 light years. So you can see that, uh, 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 you can see that there are, these are literally millions, millions of uh, light years across in the sky. And, and, you, and you have jets which remain, which are steadily supplying energy, remaining collimated over such large distances. This is, by the way, a galaxy which we had found with the GMRT, Effelsberg, and the VLA telescopes, and it still continues to be the largest single structure or the largest galaxy uh, known in the universe. I've just shown you three images, uh, results which come, which are, where GMRT has played an important role. And, 
And as I said, the jets need not be linear all the time um, because when they're fixed to a central engine, which we will talk about in a little while, and the jets can process if they're disturbed from their uh, ejection axis, like a top, they can process, and that will manifest itself in the shapes and structures of the jets which you see. So this is possibly the source which is about two megaparsecs across. Again, to remind those who may not be familiar with the terminology that one parsec is 3.26 light years. And this is an object which uh, Pratik Dabhade uh, from, is currently working on. And, and you can see the beautiful images which have been made with the GMRT. And also this is another low frequency telescope called LOFAR, a base centered in Netherlands with, base, with antennas all across Europe. Uh, a large part of Europe. Then I wanted to also show you this object, which uh, uh, which my former student Chiranjeev Konan had worked on. And you can see that here, unlike the other sources which I've shown you so far, that there are two very distinct lobes of emission. So what appears in this particular case is that the jet has switched itself off. So one important question that we'll try to at least get a glimpse of is what triggers these sources? What triggers um, nuclear activity at all to form these jets. And, and this is one object where there are two pairs of lobes indicating that a jet has actually switched off and then switched on again. So such episodic activity may be sort of clear, maybe uh, common in active galactic nuclei. So these all these jets are manifestations of an active galactic nucleus, an AGN, uh, which is characterized by some you know, interesting and exotic forms of activity in the nucleus. And we will have a look at some, you know, forms of it. They are anchored to a supermassive black hole. But more details of AGN is something which Gulab Devangan is going to talk to you about. Okay. Now, so far, I've talked about uh, radio galaxies and quasars, which are associated with elliptical galaxies. Okay. Now, uh, I'll, there, are two, uh, there are two, three questions so I'll take a small break over here and try to answer your questions. I think I have to unmute you. So let me start off with Junik Sengupta, who was uh, asked to unmute. One second. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Ah, yeah, you're audible. Please go ahead with your question. Yes, sir. Uh, so my question was, on the first part of your lecture, when you defined that the lecture, that the jets, when the force emitted uh, later on, they are first emitted in the form of two lo lobes on both the sides, and later on, they just collide towards a single one. So my question was, what results in this uh, uh, collision of this uh, collision of the two jets into a single one on one side? Is uh, it due to relativistic temperature of them? Uh, actually, why why do two jets? Uh, no, actually, uh, it is not that the two jets become one sided. Uh, what happens is that in 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 a certain class of sources, uh, the jets appear to be jets are more symmetric. Uh, whereas in another in in uh, in other class in another class of objects, the jets appear to be one sided, but the jets are uh, are there on both sides. If I were to go back to the first image which I showed you of M eighty seven, for example, if you look at this object, uh, this is not uh, Herbert Curtis's image. This is a more recent image, uh, and what you see over here is, uh, is on the right. You can see an infrared image over here. Okay. Uh, what, what is shown in red over here is an infrared image and you can see the jet structure but you can also see a see a sort of circular kind of structure at the opposite side so that is yes. believed to be due to a shock front which is created by the jet which is moving in the opposite direction okay now the question as to why jet appears one-sided uh, that is an issue which i will actually deal with it at some length uh, later either today or tomorrow. So I will not uh, sort of tell you much about that, but uh, but the fact that there are lobes on opposite sides and also there is evidence of a shock front over here suggests that even in these sources that there is a jet on the opposite side, but we are not being able to detect it. But why are some jets more asymmetric than others is uh, something which we will uh, talk about uh, later. Okay? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, Ayush Garg, um, can you unmute yourself? Or uh, Hello, sir. Am I audible? Hi, 
Ayush, go ahead. Uh, Judith Sengupta, after you finish the ray, lower your hand so that we don't get confused, okay? All right, thanks. Ayush, go ahead. Yes, sir. Sir, my question is, when you're showing us the, um, the two nodes generating out of the uh, jets, uh, they are condensing at after reaching at some point. Why is that happening? And uh, what, why are they continuously moving ahead? There is no atmosphere, there is no opposing force or section or any other force available to contract them. No. Okay. No, uh, there is. Uh, okay. No, no, me. Uh, the first thing is that uh, it is not emptiness. All right. Uh, all galaxies, they have medium between the stars called the interstellar medium. All right. Um, for example, if you look at our own galaxy and you look up at the night sky, um, and uh, you, you see the stars. Um, our eyes are not generally sensitive to the faint brightness or the different components of the interstellar medium, which may be emitting at different wavelengths. But when you look at the volume which is occupied by stars in a galaxy, it is extremely small. And, and the medium between the stars is something called the interstellar medium. A major component of this, of the interstellar medium, is just hydrogen. Uh, which is the most abundant element of the universe. But you will also get all the different species which have been synthesized into the stars and the stars explode. Uh, they, they, these form the general interstellar medium. So there are very dense clouds of gas as well called giant molecular clouds. So I'll not digress into a, med into a lecture on the interstellar medium, but what I will tell you is that the jets are trying to work their way through the interstellar medium of the host galaxy. And and the thing is that, in, if, for example, if the jet is weak and the interstellar medium is very dense, the jet may not be able to propagate outwards at all. So it propagates outwards driven by at a velocity which is, uh, which is the momentum flux density, momentum uh, in the beam. That has to be balanced by the ramp pressure of the external medium. Ramp pressure is something which you feel when you run against anything. If you run against, uh, if you're running, you feel, feel the ramp pressure of the of the atmosphere, which is proportional to density multiplied by the square of the velocity. That is why when, when athletes run, they sort of bend their bodies to minimize the kind of pressure uh, resistance of the air. Okay, So similarly, all these jets are also finding resistance. As they go forward, they will get the uh, medium between groups of galaxies. Gro galaxies are not also isolated. You'll hear from Shomuk a little bit more today about groups and clusters of galaxies. So the jets are moving forward at a velocity which is governed by the pressure balance at the edge of the hotspot. Or in the case of the sources which form hotspots, the others are where they're sort of just driven by the plasma which is being emitted from the central region of the galaxy. But they're always interacting with the external medium, uh, whether it be the Fanner of Riley class one or class two sources, okay? Now, Abhijit, um, your question, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, my uh, question has already been partially answered in your first one. Okay. Sir, I just one small query. Yeah. Like uh, when we see these uh, asymmetries in the in the, in, in the jets, I mean, one side we are observing the jet, uh, other side we are not observing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, is it that we are missing that part? I mean, uh, it's, uh, no, we are, we are missing. We are missing. We are missing that part because if it is weaker, it may not be picked up by the observations. Exactly, exactly, sir. Okay. But, but the so, thing is that, but the thing is that, why is it weaker? That's the question we will try to answer. All right. Okay. 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 And that will come to later. Thank you. Right? Okay. Uh, so Abhijit. Okay, uh, this is the last question we'll take and then we will move on to the next part, okay? Saurav or Upare? Can you unmute yourself? Saurav Upare, you had a question? Yes, sir. Uh, hello, sir. I'm, I'm audible? Yeah, audible, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, good morning, sir. Uh, sir, uh, my question was that, sir, the relativistic jet, uh, what is uh, we are now discussing, sir, it is because of the uh, yeah, because the supermassive black holes are consuming uh, some other stars or any other matter because of that. So that that we will come to later in the lecture. Okay. So what is what is the source of emission that we will come to in a short while? All right. 
one more question sir uh, sir that uh, new image has been came up of uh, m87 uh, showing the magnetic fields of that uh, yes so what so what is that uh, so i been mean, so hard what to means that you know the, this the, the, the near the black hole uh, there would be magnetic fields threading it uh, so what the new image shows is the structure of the magnetic field uh, um, the from the polarization the from it is a polarized map, polarized uh, in, uh, sort of uh, intensity map uh, which uh, they have uh, published recently and it basically sort of confirms what one always knew or one believed that the magnetic fields thread uh, the uh, accretion disk uh, and are probably responsible in some way for the formation and launching of jets yeah So we'll move on right now. Uh, we'll move on right now, and we'll periodically stop uh, uh, so that we can take in a few questions as well uh, as we go along. Okay. Now uh, I've talked so far about elliptical galaxies and quasars, and the quasars with prominent jets. The host galaxies are also elliptical usually, but and but there are exceptions to it. But the general rule is that these powerful jets are associated with. elliptical galaxies which are also known as early type galaxies which is something which you would have met earlier on in this series of lectures okay now i will come to another class of active galactic nuclei uh, which was discovered which was actually discovered earlier a lot of these early observers uh, because the field had not developed noted some of the peculiarities which were seen uh, for example in 19 as early as 1908 uh, far at the lick observatory a uh, lick observatory as you saw was uh, was very m87 uh, image was also taken by curtis in 1918 and they had a telescope which was uh, denoted by uh, donated by a, a british politician actually uh, who was trying to sell it but initially gave it gave it free as far as i'm aware and that that was one of the prime prime instruments of the time and what he noticed was that uh, uh, that he noticed an optical spectrum of a galaxy which had very prominent emission lines he looked at ngc 1068 uh, this is the general catalog um, um, and and notice prominent emission lines and why was this peculiar because if you take the spectrum of a normal galaxy uh, like our own milky way then what you would find is the um, the spectrum if you take of it it will be the aggregate spectrum of the stars and from your lectures on st stars you would have seen that the stars have absorption line spectrum light which is absorbed by the cooler outer layers from the photosphere from the photosphere which is coming out and so it is dominated by the absorption lines so if you take a galaxy normally you would, it will be dominated by the absorption lines but what is peculiar about these objects of this object was that it had very prominent emission lines this is also noticed by stiffer at the level observatory and the emission lines are similar to planetary nebulae planetary nebulae are sort of hot gas which is emitted in the late stages of evolution of low mass stars and he saw that the lines were resolved and had reasonable widths corresponding to velocities of hundreds of kilometers per second but it took uh, took nearly 35 years for carl seifert to announce to the world that from the results of a survey spectroscopic survey of galaxies that this was quite common actually it was not just one odd galaxy but but uh, about 10% or so slightly more number of such galaxies with semi stellar nuclei this image of one of them that it had a nucleus over here which looks star like if you had a short exposure photograph it would look, look even more stellar and and then it had prominent emission lines so this is different from the spectrum of the normal galaxies okay now if you look at the spectrum i'll just show you quickly what the spectrum of a normal galaxy and a and a spiral galaxy look a normal spiral galaxy or elliptical galaxy looks like this is what it is dominated by you can see absorption lines all right now and from the absorption lines you go and estimate what the redshift is now if you look at a seifert i'll come to seifert 1 and 2 in a moment but you can see how distinctly different this galaxy is all right it is dominated by the emission lines and a continuum emission which is due uh, to the central sort of object which is sitting over here and and you can see over here that this particular object um, has both narrow lines of h alpha and it also has a very broad line all right here the widths of the lines are due to the random motion or the velocities of the clouds of gas 
which are emitting the clouds. If you look at the nine widths which may arise because of transition probabilities or physics that you're familiar with, pressure broadening, etc., that those lines will be much narrower. These lines can correspond to velocities of thousands of kilometers per second. And they can only happen if the gaseous clouds are, uh, are moving about very randomly. So there is one category of the Seaford galaxy, which as you saw a little while earlier, are hosted by spiral galaxies generally. Okay, they may be the odd with galaxy or few may look elliptical like, but by and large, the general rule is that they're hosted by spiral galaxies. And, and there's another class of Seifert's where again it is dominated by emission lines, but you don't see the broad lines. Okay, we will not touch upon too much upon the differences between two because I think Gulab uh, is going to talk to you about AGN and he will touch upon the differences of the two kinds of Seifert's. My idea is only to introduce the object and talk about radio jets. But it is important to realize that these objects, which have very broad lines, uh, these perhaps also have broad lines, but not able to see them. That is something which, again, as I said, Gula will talk to you about. But they all hint towards something exotic going on in the nuclear regions of these galaxies. And when you image these Seifert galaxies, uh, then also you find evidences of radio jets. So I'll just show you an image of that. But before doing that, just let's recap what we have said, that Seifert galaxies, which are hosted by spiral galaxies and are characterized by very prominent emission lines, unlike the normal galaxies, which are characterized by absorption lines, that what you have are two classes of Seiferts. Seifert 1 have narrow lines, with widths corresponding to velocities of hundreds of kilometers per second, as well as broad lines with widths which can go up to about thousands of kilometers per second. Seifert 2 also show prominent emission lines, but the broad lines are either weak or they're usually not seen. Then there are the intermediate types, okay? Astronomers actually classify objects to try and see if they can get some hints as to what the physics might be telling us. Okay, that is the prime motivation for trying to classify. And this is a, a classic example of a jet in a Seifert galaxy. This is uh, a radio image of it ma made with the Manchester radio link interferometer of George Bank Observatory. And the nucleus of the core component lies within this compact bright component C4. And these objects, the Seifert galaxies are much, much less luminous by order of two, uh, order of sort of, um, order of magnitude or two at least, compared to the radio galaxies and quasars, which I talked about earlier. So in the literature, these weaker radio sources are often referred to as radio weak or sometimes even radio quiet. Whereas the luminous radio galaxies whose luminosities could be about 10 to the power of 26, 27, 28 watts per, or 25 watts per hertz per steradian. Um, whereas these ones would be two to three orders, 100 to 1,000 times weaker compared to the galaxies and quasars I showed you earlier. Uh, on the right, what is shown is the same image, okay? Our contours is a radio image, but also it shows you uh, an ionization map, as we call it. This is the ratio of the O3 emission line to the H alpha emission line. And these diagnostics tell you about the status of ionization of the gas. And I'll not get into too much of detail of that, except to say that, you know, when the jets flow out, as we talked about a little while earlier in response to a question, that they interact with the interstellar medium, because of the large amount of energy in this, they can also ionize the gas. And whether, and these diagnostics tell you whether it is ionized by shocks or whether it is ionized by hard photons which come out from the nucleus. So these are important diagnostics to understand the central regions. But our focus will be on jets today, all right? So what we have are Seifert galaxies, radio galaxies, and quasars, which we talked about, just to revise. And you can see the huge amounts of energy that we're talking about. So this is energies, I put it in a different wave band to show that energy is emitted across the wave band. Uh, it is not, you, you can, to learn and understand an object in its entirety, we need to be able to and look at the spectral energy distribution from radio to X-rays and gamma rays. Seifert galaxies by and large are hosted by spiral galaxies. We saw NGC 4151 as an example. Radio galaxies are hosted by elliptical galaxies, although there are a few exceptions. 
M87, Messier 87, and Sigma C we talked about. Quasars are highly luminous in the X-rays. They can be hosted by elliptical or spiral. 3C273 is the example we looked at. And usually the radio loud ones tend to be hosted by elliptical galaxies. And normal galaxies like Andromeda Nebula is what I've listed over here. They are usually much less luminous in the X-rays. These X-rays can be contributed uh, marginally by the nuclear region, but also by you know exotic stars, right? X-ray binaries and all that, which reside or supernovae, which go out the hot gas radiating in X-rays. So this is the kind of uh, luminosities that we see from uh, these active galaxies. But what I should stress over here is that when I look at spiral galaxies or when I look at elliptical galaxies or when I look at all quasars, it is only about 10% of them that have these powerful jets going out or jets going out or squirting out of them, which are active. For example, if I took a volume of space in the universe, counted all the elliptical galaxies over there, say there are a thousand elliptical galaxies over there, roughly about only 10% of them would be actually powerful radio emitters like the ones we just saw. Why that is the case is another interesting question to which we don't have very good answers, but we probably have some good guesses at the moment. Now, this is my sort of just to introduce you to introduce you to uh, the kind of jets that we see. So jets are manifested in, uh, in galaxies, elliptical galaxies, as well as spiral galaxies. And in a recent project, which I've been doing with a large number of collaborators led by Ranieri Balti from Italy, that we find that there are jets, even in galaxies, when you observe them with high resolution, um, high resolution uh, jet-like structures, even in galaxies which are which have been classified as just galaxies which are forming stars. Uh, so there is, so there, so we'll try and touch upon that aspect as well, because these are all in some sense related to the presence of a black hole at the center, all right? Okay, I'll just, um, now I'll take a brief sort of detour. Uh, let me see what, 10, 40, right? So we'll take about 15 or 20 minutes more. We'll take a brief detour right now of, uh, I don't see any hands up. So uh, we have, okay. So I'll take a brief detour on the physical processes responsible for the emission from the jets. So I'll do this rather rapidly because uh, uh, Dipankar has already talked to you about emission processes. I will just sort of briefly recap and apply it to jets. Right? Now, you've already heard about uh, uh, of uh, non-thermal processes, the continuum non-thermal processes. Right now, we talk, we'll talk about only continuum processes, not, radio li not lines, not line emission. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that the jet in 3C273, there are no emission lines from there. It is continuum emission. And this continuum emission was recognized quite early uh, to be due to, from the lobes and the jets of radio galaxies as well, to be due to synchrotron emission, which was also called magneto strahlung in the early days. But now I think synchrotron is something which is widely used and we'll stick to that. So these are ultra relativistic particles accelerated in a magnetic field due to the Lorentz force. And normally you would be familiar with mildly relativistic or non-relativistic electrons or particles, and you're familiar with cyclotron emission. But when the particles are highly relativistic, the zone of emission, the, the lobes of emission get forwarded into a narrow cone of emission, cone angle, half cone angle being given by one upon gamma, where gamma is a Lorentz factor of the radiating particle. So distant observer will see a series of pulses when the cone sweeps his or her line of sight at a Doppler shift to gyration frequency, but these yielding a spectrum at all harmonics, but the harmonics are very closely spaced yielding a continuum. So basically what you should remember is that most of the energy is emitted at a frequency which is close to given by the, the square of the Lorentz factor and the perpendicular component of the magnetic field. So what this means is that when I want to see continuum synchrotron emission at X-ray energies, I need higher energy electrons compared to what I see at radio frequencies. So higher the energy of the electron, higher the frequency at which it's going to radiate. And if it is the same Lorentz factor, if you increase the magnetic field, it is going to radiate at a higher frequency, all right? But you can see that the dependence on the Lorentz factor is much stronger than on the magnetic field. Just to give you one number that 
gamma is suppose gamma is of the order of 10 to the power of 4 which you can see is nearly the velocity of light and if that moves in a field of 10 microcos then it would emit energy at about 1 gigahertz okay 1 gigahertz is roughly about 20 centimeters or so so you can radio waves or something which you can measure with a ruler so you can see that what are the kind of Lorentz factors which are involved the magnetic fields are generally weak in the lobes so 10 microcos is a reasonable number now, what happens is that that is for a single particle. But all these jets, they have non-thermal spectrum. I mean, it is not a black body spectrum. It is not thermal free free emission. So it has a parallel kind of spectrum, which can be modified. And, and that is because of a parallel distribution of the energy of the radiating particles. That means there are many more electrons of lower energy, which all add up compared to the number of electrons at higher energies, which, as we saw, will radiate at a higher frequency. At a higher frequency, the radiative losses will also be stronger. Here you can see it depends on the square of both the magnetic field as well as the energy of the particles. So if I have electrons radiating at X-ray wavelengths, because they're radiating energy much faster, their lifetimes are going to be much smaller. Right? So a characteristic signature of synchrotron emission is that it will be polarized and also the parallel form of the spectrum, all right? Now, the other important process which is relevant in terms of our understanding of, uh, of the physical process responsible for emission in the jet is inverse Compton scattering. Normally in textbooks at the undergraduate level or graduate level, we learn about Compton scattering. But here what is happening is that high energy electrons scatter off low energy photons with the electrons losing the energy, right? In a classical Compton thing, you have the electron at rest effectively with the photon scattering of it and losing energy. But here, these electrons, or these photons are, are scattered off very high energy electrons and they capture energy from the electrons and get kicked off to higher energies. So in a certain regime, you'll find that the, the frequency of the inverse scattered, called Compton scattered photon is proportional to or, or roughly of the order of gamma squared into the initial energy, okay? Gamma squared, gamma is the uh, Lorentz factor of the, of the radiating electron. Suppose, for example, as I said, there is a one gigahertz photon uh, and, and, and you have a Lorentz factor of 10 to the power of four. So you can see that 10 to the power of four is 10 to the power of eight uh, multiplied by 10 to the power of nine would give you 10 to the power of 17. So which is in the, up in the X-ray region of the spectrum. So you can see that the photons can be scattered to high energies giving rise to X-ray emission. The scattered radiation has a parallel with a similar spectral index as that of a synchrotron radiation. Now you can ask yourself what process dominates? That will depend on the ratio of the photon energy density to the magnetic energy density. You can see that the synchrotron emission depends on the magnetic field, whereas inverse Compton scattering would depend on the photon energy density. All right. So the, phot the photons can come from the synchrotron uh, source itself, or also in some cases, it can come from the cosmic microwave background radiation, which you have also heard about, which permeates the universe. The radiation energy density of the CMBR increases with redshift. There's one plus z to the power of four. So inverse Compton losses can be more significant at higher redshifts. Now, from basic synchrotron theory, you can also estimate what is the total energy in the particles, okay? I have not gone through the derivations over here, but for those who are interested, um, I can refer you to books later. But basically, you can see that the magnetic field energy density you're familiar with, which is B squared upon 8 pi. So if the total magnetic energy would be B squared upon 8 pi multiplied by the volume. And for a source of luminosity L, you can also apply the radiation energy loss formula minus the EDT, which I mentioned earlier, and calculate what is the, uh, and relate the, uh, relate the luminosity to the rate of loss of energy and calculate the total energy in the particles, okay? But usually the energy is not just in the electrons, which, you're, uh, which you are able to observe because electrons being lighter can get accelerated more easily. And so you'd see synchrotron emission from it. But there are also protons and higher energy particles, so there is a fudge factor which takes account of this. 
So total energy is the sum of the particle energy and the magnetic field energy. And what the, what the estimate of figure on the right shows you is that, um, is that because of the dependences, there is a minimum energy which you get. And normally there is evidence that energy is in fact closer, quite close, reasonably close to the magnetic energy, close to the uh, minimum energy. And at the minimum energy, there is a rough equipartition of particle and magnetic energy densities. So that also gives you an a way to estimate the equipartition magnetic field in these lobes of emission. Okay, right now don't worry too much about it, but just be familiar that the total energy of, of the system can be calculated and given the energy in the particles and the energy in the fields, the way it values would be, you can get a minimum energy for the total energy. And using that, one can estimate what is the energy in these lobes of emission. This is the image of Cygnus A, which I showed you earlier. This is a slightly better or deeper image made by Rick Burley and his collaborators at a very large array, which is located in New Mexico in the United States. And here you can see a, a wee counter jet over here, and you can see the jet a bit more prominently. But uh, what I want to point out is that the huge amount of energy that is stored over there. It's about 10 to the power of 60 to 10 to the power of 61 ergs. So we have a lot of energy in these lobes, and uh, which is stored in these lobes of radio emission. Okay. Now, what have we learned so far? Uh, and how do we apply it? We want to ask ourselves, uh, we are focusing on jets, and we want to ask ourselves that are there any ways that we can identify the sources of emission in the jets? And we look at the Fanner of Riley class one and class two sources separately. In the radio, we know it is synchrotron emission. For example, if I look at the Fanner of Riley class one sources, I can determine the spectrum and I can determine the polarization. And I, from both these two characteristics, I can determine that they are, they, are, um, um, they are due to synchrotron emission. Many of these, opt many of these radio jets, the FR1 sources, I can also look them up in the optical. I can measure the optical flux density. And just as I showed the spectrum, the radio and the spectrum, radio and the optical spectrum are also consistent with the non-thermal spectrum. And I can also measure the polarization at optical wavelengths. And both spectra and polarization tells me that the optical emission from the jets is also due to the broadband is due to synchrotron emission. I can look at the X-ray emission from any of these jets. They are also uh, observable. And I can look at from the emission of, of the X-ray emission, is it consistent with the extrapolation of the radio and optical spectrum to the X-ray wavelengths? Is it a continuous non-thermal spectrum? So extension with relativistic electron spectrum from radio to X-rays and optical. So it seems to fit into one power law, although you'll find that the X-ray can sometimes steepen because the lifetimes of these particles are low, but by and large, we can understand them as being due to synchrotron emission. And here the, the, the magnetic energy density in all these cases is much greater than the photon energy density. So inverse Compton scattering, which we talked about, is not a major contributor to it. Here is an example of a Fanner of Riley class one source. This is one of the very nearby galaxies, uh, Centaurus A, which is visible in the southern sky. The relativistic electrons which are required to be required to produce the X-ray emission is greater than about 10 to the power of 13 electron volts. So you can see these are hugely energetic electrons. And because they are very energetic, the lifetimes are also very small. The lifetimes are the order of 100 years or so. So what this tells you, this is, for example, in this image, uh, the contour are the radio image and the false color is the X-ray image. They don't, the X-ray and the radio don't exactly coincide, although they're in the broad same area. And the X-rays due to shocks or other reasons, they are regions of recent particle acceleration, okay? So these are, because these are not going to last so long, okay? Uh, and, then, and then these are going to sort of die off easily unless they are replenished with a fresh supply of electrons. But we can see that the continuum emission in jets is due to, uh, in Fanner of Friday class one sources is due to 
uh, synchrotron emission, and we can understand that in terms of synchrotron emission right from uh, the radio to the optical to the X-ray wavelengths. Okay. But however, when I look at Fanner of Riley class two objects, where the emission is, jets are one-sided, all right, there seems to be a fundamental difference. If I look at the spectra, I can find radio, say, at a high end. Then I find that the X-rays are also pretty high and the optical is low, okay? So there seems to be many more X-ray photons which are emitted than I can account for by joining up the radio and the optical wavelengths. So here what, is what has been invoked is that inverse Compton scattering of the radio photons to the X-rays seems to play an important role. And what is preferred uh, explanation is that it is inverse Compton scattering with a cosmic microwave background. And because these jets are moving at highly relativistic velocities, as I mentioned earlier, in the frame of the source, the cosmic energy density is enhanced by a factor of gamma squared. Here, gamma is not the Lorentz factor of the individual electron, but the Lorentz factor corresponding to the bulk motion of the jet itself. So you can see that both these processes, synchrotron emission and, and uh, mm, synchrotron emission and uh, inverse Compton emission are important aspects in terms of trying to understand the emission processes occurring in jets. For Fanner of Riley class one, the diffuse amorphous jets with velocities are probably lower, uh, that you do get synchrotron spectrum, which can from right from the radio to the X-rays, which can be understood in terms of synchrotron emissivity. But in the case of the FR2, uh, FR2 jets, uh, the Fanner of Riley class two, where the jets are moving at highly relativistic velocities, inverse Compton scattering, possibly with the cosmic microwave background radiation is responsible significantly for the X-ray emission that we see. In fact, a lot of the jets in quasars have been studied extensively at X-ray wavelengths, although radio astronomy or radio jets were the predominant way of studying these jets um, until the advent of the Chandra, particularly the Chandra X-ray telescope, although earlier Rosette and all showed signs of jets in a few sources. But the field really opened up at X-ray wavelengths with the launch of the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which along with its high angular resolution and sensitivity really opened up the field of X-ray jets, okay? So we have just finished an, uh, about an hour since we started. Um, I'll, I'll probably just take a few minutes to introduce why, uh, why we need supermassive black holes, and then we will open it up for questions. Um, I will not take too long, just probably five minutes or so. Now, we have, we have looked at different kinds of active galaxies. We have looked at the enormous energies in them, and we have looked at jets which are being launched um, sometimes at you know relativistic velocities or a fair fraction of the speed of light. We'll talk about you know measurement of speeds tomorrow, but today I will just introduce you to the initial arguments or why we need a supermassive black hole. Okay. Now um, there, there are a few arguments which I wanted to sort of highlight towards you. One is the light widths, which I said could be thousands of kilometers per second. Okay. Now if the line widths are large and the clouds which are moving about just by balancing using the varial theorem, or you can just put MGMM upon R squared and V squared upon R, you can estimate the mass of the central object. You put in the velocity of the lines, because as you know, the, just as the planets move around the sun because of the gravitational influence, these clouds are also moving around, um, around the massive object at the center due to its gravitational influence. And we, can, we have to determine R, G is a gravitational constant. And I've just taken a ballpark number of 10 power six. These numbers can also be determined, uh, which hopefully Gulab will touch on, but we will not have the time to do that. But if you do a simple calculation, you'll find that you get masses of the order of, in this particular instance, of about a billion solar masses. So first instance to say that there is indeed a massive object which is residing in the center of the galaxies that we're talking about. We can also talk about, 
talk, uh, try and get an estimate of the mass from causality or variability arguments. The nuclear regions that I talked about are, all, are, are generally variable. And the higher the frequency that you go to, the stronger or the shorter the time scales of variability. Okay? Here you can see the variability of a particular um, quasar 3CR279 right from radio frequencies at a lower end to optical x-rays and gamma rays. And you can see that the radio, it is varying, but not as dramatically as at gamma rays and x-rays, okay? So, and, and the reason is that when you're looking at these strong variabilities of short time scales, the short time scales also responds to short length scales. So length scales presumably very close to the center of the central engine or a supermassive object that we talk about. So for, this, for, the, for that region to vary in a coherent way, like the signal has to be communicated and the maximum velocity you all know is a velocity of light. So given, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the Schwarzschild radius, which is basically 2 gm upon c squared, m is the mass. So that is the only matter on which it depends upon. And you can calculate from causality arguments across the Schwarzschild radius, usually the, the, the last um, stable orbit is way beyond that, that this is an expression for the variability arguments, 10 to the power of minus five seconds. So if you had a one solar mass black hole, okay, then the time scales of variability would be very small. Okay, and you do find that in galactic X-ray sources that are varying very, very rapidly, flickering away. But on the other hand, when you look at uh, extra galactic objects, they vary on much longer time scales. Okay, so for example, to get a year's, um, you know, sort of, uh, <coughs> you know, variability of these time scales, you can plug in, you can plug in the variability time scale and calculate what the mass would be. So if it is about a year, ten to the power of seven seconds or so, you can see that ten to the power of five will come over here. So mass would be pretty high, right? Uh, so, so the thing is that causality arguments also enable you to go and measure the, as make an estimate of the mass of the central object. And where there, both the measurements are available within the reasonable uncertainties that they are, uh, they are, uh, they are quite similar. They, they sort of check, right? So uh, maybe, okay, causality variability, okay. And the other aspect which I wanted to mention about is that what we talked about uh, that huge amount of energy, 10 to the power of 46 ergs per second. And we will see tomorrow probably, because today we are running out of time, 11.10, um, uh, as to why luminosity also requires a huge amount of energy to be, uh, to explain this huge amount of energy, uh, we can do it effectively by accretion onto a supermassive object. So you need a massive object at the center and a natural uh, candidate for a very massive object at the center of the order of 10 to the power of nine solar masses or, or in that ballpark, depending on these numbers, is a supermassive black hole. Ranjit Mishra is going to tell you about observational evidences that we have for the existence of such massive black holes. But we know that these black holes exist from the center of our own galaxies, which has a mass of a few million solar masses to about 10 to the power of 10 solar masses or so. So that we'll pick up from tomorrow uh, to, to try and understand why a supermassive black hole is required to understand this huge luminosity. And then we will look at, um, look at some of the observational evidences uh, for the jet uh, asymmetry as well, uh, which, we, which we said we will deal with later. And we'll also look at how people have tried to prove the connections between a black hole and a disk and the launching of a jet. Launching of a jet is still, uh, you know, we will see tomorrow that it is still something in the frontiers of research. Uh, there are no firm answers, but there are interesting clues and there are interesting theoretical developments as well. And we'll have a brief glimpse at that, but we will not go get into the de details of accretion physics because that would not be possible given the time constraints which we have. Okay, so I will stop now over here and uh, we will take any questions on uh, today's presentation. Or related to it. So, Junik Sen Gupta, you have a question. Can you unmute yourself? 
Yes, sir. Uh, is it open now? Yeah, yeah, you're audible, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you, sir. So my question was from the last part of the talk, that is, uh, you explained the, super the need for the supermassive black holes. Yeah. Now, as we know, the supermassive black holes are not quite regularly similar to that of the regular astrophysical black holes, but these supermassive black holes can be a candidate for these jets. So is it possible the primordial black holes, which are formed by the cosmological measures, probably, are also candidate for uh, these jets? I mean, are, uh, can this be possible that jets are similar with them? Hey, today we have, I mean, we have evidences that these uh, supermassive black holes uh, were also present very early in the evolution of the universe. Okay, now uh, uh, I didn't, I, I mean, I should just make a comment on your question saying that uh, these are not the astrophysical black holes. They're all astrophysical black holes. Okay, whether it be the stellar mass black holes which we find in our galaxy or the supermassive black holes which are found in the centers of galaxies. And today, as you know, that from gravitational wave measurements, that we also have evidence of intermediate mass black holes. So there are different regimes and, and we will probably, as gravitational wave interferometry develops, and we also get to measure uh, from observations or infer masses of lower mass black holes, that we don't know whether it would be a continuum or whether there would be peaks, whether certain kinds of uh, masses may be preferred over others. But, uh, but, but, but astrophysical black holes occupy a large range of masses. And as far as the powering of AGN is concerned, they seem to be in the range of whatever, from the center of our own galaxy, you know, is a few million solar masses to about 10 to the power of 10 solar masses or so. But uh, I'll, I'll, we'll discuss tomorrow that to launch jets, probably a minimum value of that, uh, of that mass is required. Uh, ma not alone, not 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 mass alone, but probably some other properties of the black hole as well. So that we look at tomorrow. Uh, but but in terms of how these supermassive black holes formed, uh, that is a very interesting question, and that is something which is still not absolutely settled, because black holes could coalesce, could could uh, could uh, suck in matter, increase in mass, and as you know. Uh, black hole masses, black holes are characterized by charge, mass, and angular momentum. So when galaxies collide and combine, black holes could also coalesce, increasing in mass. But I think, we, but we do know that, you know, supermassive black holes exist pretty early on in the evolution of the universe. And I think models of galaxy formation uh, will, will have to sort of take that on board and understand both uh, formation of massive black holes as well as uh, formation of galaxies at the same epoch. Tomorrow also, I'll also highlight a relation saying that, uh, which Ranjit may also touch upon in more detail, that the masses of black holes is very closely related to galaxy properties as well. So these are linked together, but, uh, but detailed physical models is something which we need to understand a bit more. Okay. 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 Are there any other questions? Uh, Not okay. So, anybody else has a question? Okay. If there are no other questions, uh, I, I, okay, I'll check the chat box if there are questions. But uh, and and you can also put the questions in that Google sheet, which is available to you. And uh, whatever questions are there, I will. Uh, take it up tomorrow all right so we will i'll stop sharing now and you can take a short break and then uh, shomak's lecture is there at 11:30 okay all the best thank you very much